Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here in this space. Good to see you online. And thank you, Pastor Jeff, for uh, that great intro. Uh, last week, uh, was uh, Pastor Jeff was sharing with us, he was kind of introducing this series that I'm about to, uh, to launch, and that he was talking about the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ for the sake of others. And you hear us say that often. Pastor Jeff says it often. I say it often. Other people on staff, we say that often from the pulpit because we are, we as the church, are in the business of making disciples. That's what Pastor Jeff talked about last week, is that that's our core business is making disciples disciples. And the reason we want to say that a lot is because there's a lot of things that we do here at the church. There's a lot of activity that takes place. Pastor Jeff just mentioned all the cars that are on our parking lot because of all the activity that takes place here uh, as part of Hope Church. So we have a food support ministry that supports about 500 families every month. Those folks not only are driving through our parking lot, but they're, be, they're receiving food, and that's an activity that is, if you're not ever here on a Wednesday, there's this flurry of activity. There's no space in the parking lot. There's so much going on, and that's this incredible thing that takes place uh, each month here at, at because of Hope Church and because of you all. The other things we do are also activities. So we have uh, programming for our kids, like our vacation Bible school and, and uh, our drama camps and our mission trips. We have activities like just yesterday, I was out in a little bit of rain, not a lot, but a little bit of rain at our annual golf tournament. Man, I killed it out there. <laughs> just, it was so good, I didn't hand in our card, our team. I felt bad as one of the pastors. I shouldn't be winning anything at our tournament. So I thought it best just to have a really bad day. Right, Chris? Yeah, it was, just, it was just the best thing for us to do. But we had that yesterday, and we raised money for our food pantry ministry. And we even, on some Sundays, have donuts in the lobby. Good, right? Man, those are all great activities. Those are all good things. And the reason that we often say that we're being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ for the sake of others, the reason we say that our core business is to make disciples is that all of those things I just listed, all those things that we do, while they are all in and of themselves really good, they are not our core business. They are a means to our core business, which is making disciples. That donuts are good. Amen? Amen? Amen. But serving donuts is not our core business. That's what Dunkin' Donuts does, right? Except now they're not even Dunkin' Donuts. They're Dunkin'. See that? They've changed their core business. Activities are good. The things that we do are all good. But hosting activities is not our core business. Do you remember Blockbuster? Yeah, yeah, you know, a few minutes ago we were down here talking about cassette tapes. I want to talk about VHS tapes. Do you remember Blockbuster? Blockbuster was the thing. They were the king of Friday nights. I remember when my kids came home from school on Friday nights, the activity was we loaded up into the car, we went to Blockbuster, and we chose what videos we were going to watch that weekend. How many of you remember those days? Look at that. Yeah, you see that? It was the go-to place. There was this incredible variety, a library of entertainment that was available to you as long as the person in front of you didn't take the last copy, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Did you know that today, that monstrosity called Blockbuster that had over 5,000 stores at its peak now has one store? It's in Oregon. I gotta ask, what are they doing in Oregon that they still have a blockbuster, right? <laughs> but here's why. It's become a museum of what it used to be. See, here's what happened. Blockbuster thought that they were in the video delivery business. And when people no longer wanted videos that they could go pick up, Blockbuster ran out of things to do and they cease to exist, except now they're a museum. Now, somewhere along the line, there was Netflix. Do you remember Netflix? Whew. 
who doesn't know Netflix, right? Well, you know, Netflix, for those of you who may not know, started out doing the same thing. They were delivering videos. Now, one thing that they did is they said they'll mail them to your house. So you don't even have to go out on a Friday night. You can just wait at home, go to your mailbox, and there would be your video. It was on a DVD. That was so cool and so fancy, right? No longer please kind, please be kind and rewind. You didn't have to do that anymore. Now you just pop that baby in there and instantly you could watch that movie. But you see, Netflix understood their core business. They were not in the video delivery business. They were in the home entertainment business. And Netflix at the same time that they launched, almost the same time they launched their DVDs, they also launched streaming. And at first we all went, huh? What is that craziness? You can now watch a movie and it flies through the air somehow and it lands up onto your screen and you can watch it. And we were all fascinated, right? Who was fascinated with that the first time they saw it, right? Yeah, you were like, this is, this is, so, this is like witchcraft, but I like it. Netflix discovered that home entertainment doesn't need to be physical rentals but it could be streaming. And even now, Netflix, knowing that they're in the home entertainment business, is now producing their own movies, creating their own series, because they stuck to their core business, home entertainment. And Netflix is a global giant, and Blockbuster is a museum. So quoting the Apostle Paul last week, Pastor Jeff said this. He said, Jesus is all that matters. Jesus is all that matters. That our core business is Jesus. Our core business is making disciples. Our core business is that we are in the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus for the sake of others. So our vacation Bible schools, our mission trips, our food pantry, and all the other things that we do, including donuts, are not the goal. But they are a means to accomplish our one goal, which is seeing people conforming to the image of Jesus Christ for the sake of others. And this has been the core business of the church since the birth of the church. Not just the birth of Hope Church in Voorhees, but the birth of the church 2,000 years ago. This has always been the core business of the church. The Apostle Paul said it this way. Uh, he was talking to, uh, to a church in Rome, and he said, this is your core business. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping and eating and going to work life. Is that as ordinary as it can get? You're sleeping, eating, and going to work life. He said, take that life and place it before God as an offering. And then embrace what God does for you. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. This is the reason why we are so committed to our Let's Grow campaign because it really helps as a church for us to focus on this, our core business. And that is that we want to see people conform to the image of Jesus for the sake of others. And we think that takes place best when we can put into practice just a few Simple, not easy, heard that earlier today, simple practices of faith. And so in the Let's Grow campaign, we've narrowed that down into two ways to memorize it, worship plus two and one by one. Worship plus two, when we say that, we mean that there are three components to that. There's worship. We think that as, a, uh, as an individual who's seeking to grow in the likeness of Jesus, that we need to be with others and worship together. And so we worship here in this space. We worship online, as Pastor Jeff said. In all of our places, we worship as one church community. And so worship is one of those practices. And we're going to talk about that later. 
That's another one for the plus two worship plus two. The plus two is connection. We think that as part of a body of believers, we need to be connected to each other and that we grow best in community. And so we want people who are part of this faith community to grow by serving, uh, serving here in this space, to commit to being part of the ministry of this church. That's the plus, part, that's plus one of plus two. And the other part of plus two is grow, growth. We think growth is our responsibility, that we need to be growing to look like Jesus. Then there's one by one. I'm going through these really fast, I promise. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about this over the next few weeks. One by one, two practices, invitation. That's a really scary word, and I get it. I'm going to talk about my scary experience with invitation in a few minutes. But invitation, we believe that as those who are part of the body of Christ, that as we grow to look like Jesus, it's for the sake of others, that we want to share what's happened in our lives with others. Because we think Jesus matters, or that everyone matters to Jesus, and we want Jesus to meet everyone. And then the other is service. We think that as body of believers that we can grow best in our relationship with Jesus, that we can grow to look like Jesus when we choose to serve. So worship plus two, one by one. And we put these practices into our everyday, ordinary lives, we are in the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ for the sake of others. Now, this is so important. It's so important to us as this body of faith that we are going to, Pastor Jeff and I are going to spend the next couple of uh, weeks, actually all the way through the fall now, talking about these things. And so today, I want to talk about uh, expressing the practice of invitation. And I want to share with you a story from John chapter 1. It actually was a really informative story for me as I was becoming a pastor. I'm going to tell that part of the story later. But it's in the Gospel of John. It's the first chapter. I'm going to read through some verses, and we're going to read them together, and then I'm going to stop and pause as we go. So let's read that. Uh, I, I think it's verse 35, chapter 1, verse 35. Now, the following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. Now, this, this isn't the John who wrote the book. This is John the Baptist, all right? There's two Johns. One's John the Baptist. The other one's John, not the Baptist, I guess. But I don't know his last name. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's the other. So this is the other John, all right? So the following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look. There's the Lamb of God. And when John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. All John does is point. And he says, look, there he is. That's the Lamb of God. And John says that the two disciples who were with him started following. It goes on. Jesus looked around and saw them following. You know, Jesus is wary of his surroundings. He saw them following and he asked them, what do you want? They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? To come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. So while following Jesus, Jesus moves towards them. He engages them in a conversation. He asks them a question, and Jesus invites them to join him. Now, the reason I share this verse is I want you to see this. We're going to go on a little bit further, but let me pause it for just a second. Did you see how this took place? John said, look. There's the Lamb of God. The disciples moved towards Jesus, and then Jesus moved towards them. John said, look. The disciples moved, and then Jesus moved towards them. We're going to go on. The next verse. John tells us that Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John had said. So one of the two guys now that when, when John said, look, 
One of the two disciples was Andrew, right? We know that now. John just told us that. So Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon, and he told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Cephas. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. So Andrew was one of these two guys who had been following John the Baptist. After only one day, really one evening with Jesus, Andrew decides to go and invite Simon. And he says, We found something. Simon, we found something. And Andrew brings Simon with him to Jesus. And then Jesus moves towards Simon and has a conversation with him. The story keeps going. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. So Jesus went to another town. He found Philip. He said, come and follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, which is Andrew and Peter's town. So a similar thing happens the next day. Jesus is in a nearby town. He meets Philip. Philip uh, is invited. Philip chooses to follow. Now it goes on. Philip went to look for Nathanael, and he told him, we found the person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Now, get Nathaniel's response. Nazareth, can anything good come from that? Nathaniel's got this serious chip on his shoulder. I mean, he is, he's angry with somebody. He had a bad time in Nazareth once. <laughs> but look how Philip replies. Come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself, Nathaniel. And as they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. And Nathanael asked, How do you know about me? And Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. That had to freak him out. And then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And so Philip finds Nathanael. Nathanael is a skeptic, but Philip doesn't begin a debate about Jesus' origin. He doesn't even ask why, what's, what's your deal with Nazareth, Nathanael? Instead, he simply says, hey, come and see for yourself. And Jesus takes the next step and engages Nathanael in conversation. So John chapter 1 was really important to me about 32 years ago. I was at my first church. I was hired to be the youth pastor. They could only afford to hire me part-time as a youth pastor, but I was excited about part-time work as a youth pastor. And they said, hey, we'll pay you more if you're also the director of evangelism. And I just heard, we'll pay you more. And I went, sure, I'm in. And so now I went from half-time to three-quarter time as the direct youth director and the director of evangelism. And I had no idea what that meant or what I was going to do because it was 32 years ago. I was like a little baby child back then, you know? And I just went, sure. Well, here I found out is they had this scientific program that all you had to do, at least this is what they told me, is you knock on a door and you ask a few questions and people will get on their knees and cry for Jesus and you're done. And I was like, oh, I'm in. You're going to pay me to do that? Easy peasy. I got this. I then spent a month just wreaking havoc on Camden County, <laughs> doing a horrible job, knocking on doors, awkward 20-something saying, do you know about Jesus? Oh, by the way, my name is Rick. <laughs> Terrible results. I was I'm like, they're going to fire me. I can't tell anyone who Jesus is. They sent me away to a class because then I would have this all figured out. I spent my whole time just getting to know people not talking about Jesus, and they told me I failed. I was the disaster at evangelism, or so I thought. 
or I was at the time. And then I came to this realization. It is less about science and more about art. You see, science is... There's a form, and there's a formula, and there's this way of doing things, and you follow the steps in order, and art is about beauty, and it's subjective, and it's emotional, and it's conversational, and it's, it's about people, and their, who they are, and what they see, and what they feel. And so I realized that invitation is really about the art of invitation. It's about what Pastor Jeff shared last week, that when we take our ordinary, everyday lives and we live out mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, and when we choose to make allowances for people, is that by far the most Jesus thing we could ever do? To make an allowance for somebody else? When we do all these things, as he said last week, above all, do them with love. When we let peace rule our lives, when we're thankful, when we let Jesus fill us, and when we sing together, when we represent Jesus in our everyday, ordinary lives, See, it's not a list, but a way of life. That the art of invitation is subjective, and it's about beauty, and it's about emotion, and it's, it's going to look different for each of us. And there's just been this sense that when we have to talk, to talk to someone about Jesus, then we also have to defend Jesus. And Man, that couldn't be further from the truth. We don't need to protect Jesus from others. We don't need to make good arguments or even good points about Jesus. We don't have to be concerned about the what if they ask me about fill in the blank? What if I don't know what to say about fill in the blank? What if I don't have an answer? What if I don't know what I'm talking about? See, I think the art of invitation says that we aren't responsible for the next step. Jesus is. That convincing people about Jesus is not our job. And when we think it is all about us, we've made ourselves too important in the equation. That we have to choose to trust God to work in a person. And our part is just bringing Jesus nearer to the person. And that Jesus chooses to take the next step. That Jesus saw them following and he turned around and said, what are you guys looking for? That Jesus saw Nathaniel even before Nathaniel saw him and he said, I know you're a man of integrity. That we only need to say, look, I found something. Come and see for yourself. Let your everyday, ordinary life. What if your everyday, ordinary life was a trigger for an invitation? Here's my thought, and here's what's changed for me about invitation. Like I said, 32 years ago, it was knock on a door, almost fill out a questionnaire, stamp your card for Jesus, and you're good to go. I think it's different than that now. I think it's more like this. It's finding places and moments where I can say, hey, look, right there, that's Jesus. Right there, that moment, that's the kingdom of heaven. You hear me say this, you hear Pastor Jeff, you hear Pastor Heather say this. If you haven't been here on a Wednesday during food distribution, you need to just come by just to see it take place. Because it is the kingdom of heaven in action. And you can just stand in the parking lot and just point and say, look, Jesus, 
is taking place all around here. Just look. The kingdom of heaven is happening. Heaven looks like this. I also think invitation is just simply saying, hey, I found something. And it's become precious to me. Would you like to look at it? Would you like to see it? Uh, one, one of the folks who's, who uh, attends here, he, he actually is one of our drummers. He one time um, was sharing with the guys he worked with. He, he said, uh, I play drums. And they went, no way, you play drums. And he went, yeah, I play drums in a the band. They went, no way, you play drums in a band. And he went, yeah, I played drums in a band at church. And you, no way, you played drums in a band at church. And he went, yeah. And then he said, would you, oh, they went, we would love, we would kill to see that. He went, oh, we can do that. <laughs> and so he took our on-demand service and put it up on the screen in his workplace. And they got together and they watched him play in the band at church. And then the conversation became, Here's why I do this. Come here, look. Look what I found. I dedicate time to this because it made such a difference in my life. I wanted to make a difference in someone else's life, someone else's life too. So maybe it's just pointing and saying, look, maybe it's saying, hey, come and <laughs> come see what I found. Or maybe it's, hey, I forgot the third one. Oh. <laughs> Come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself. Uh, uh, come and see for yourself. See, we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to have it all figured out. Matter of fact, we certainly don't. We're deluded if we think we have all the answers. But sometimes it's just people notice something different about us. Another one, our drummers kill it around here. Another one of our drummers told me this story. He was just at work doing his thing. And someone came up to him and said, hey, we noticed there's something different about you. Are you a Christian? And he went, uh, yeah. Hey, come and see for yourself. And he invited them to church. That's crazy, right? He invited them to church. And they came and they sat with him and they enjoy it. Isn't that surprising? An invitation. Come and see for yourself. Hey, look, this is what heaven looks like. This is Jesus. I found something. Come and see for yourself. I promise you, if we can practice that, it will change our lives, and it will change the lives of the people around us. I want to challenge you in this way, and we're, we're, I'm wrapping up in the next 10 seconds. Here's my challenge. I started doing this, and I'm telling you, it, 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 it changed me. I don't have any good results yet, but it changed me, all right? Here's, because it's about, all right, I'm in the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ for the sake of others, all right? Uh, I have a, a, a card that's actually now, it's, it's no longer a physical card. It's in my phone now because the card got ruined, and it's the names of people who are dear to me, who I know, who I want to have an opportunity to say, look, or I found something, and come and follow me. And I pray for those people that I would have that opportunity. I'll tell you right now, it hasn't happened yet. The card got worn out, and I had to put it on my phone so that it would still be with me. But it's changing me because it's helping me to look for opportunities. I want to challenge you to make this your prayer, that you would say, God, uh, where is it? God, give me an opportunity to practice the art of invitation this month. And pray that prayer every day. Now, would you stand with me? And let's pray together. In all of our places, here in this place, here online, if you're online, stay with us. Let's all pray together as one church, one community of faith. And so God, I pray that you would 
continue to inspire and challenge us. That as a church, we would be in this, as individuals in this church, we would be in the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ for the sake of others. God, that we would not forget that our core business is making disciples, that all that matters is Jesus. And I pray that as you work in my life and as you work in our lives, that God, we would look and sound like Jesus to the world around us. God, I pray that we would be challenged to give us a heart of invitation. That God, we would be able to have moments where we can point and say, there's Jesus, I see it right there in that person. I see it in that activity. I see the kingdom of heaven right here. God, that we would be able to, to, to look and say, I found something and it's so dear to me, I want to share it with others. God, that we would be able to say to someone, hey, come with me, come and see for yourself. I want you to see this. God, I pray that that would be our heart and I pray that that would be our desire. God, that we would change the region around us. God, that we would see the world different because of Jesus in people's lives. And we pray all these things in your name, Jesus, the one who loves us more than we can imagine. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Have a great day. Have a great day.